Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today, this is an episode I've been waiting to do for a long time. I've got my good friend and a wonderful craftsperson, an artist, although I don't know that he's going to take credit for the artist term, uh, my good friend Jeff Luke here. Jeff is a, a contemporary maker who's active in muzzleloading and long rifle culture, and he recently has really been active in educating and and sharing what he knows with other young and uh, and newcomers, I guess, to traditional craft work. I'm really excited for this conversation. Jeff, thank you for taking the time out of your day to talk with me. Thank you, Ethan. It's it's truly a pleasure to get to talk with you. Um, something I truly enjoy and am passionate about and appreciate all that you do for the community. So it, it's my pleasure to get to, to talk to you here. Basically, I'm, I'm just a simple guy. Uh, Jeff Luke, I've been doing leather for about 15 years now, I guess. Um, but really took an interest in the in kind of the, the frontier arts, if you will, the frontier craftsmanship, probably about four or five years ago. I had been around hunting in the outdoors and shooting all my life. And uh, uh, far too in love, I guess, with modern firearms and had hunted with an inline muzzle loader for years and um, finally decided I I wanted to try a, a more primitive methodology there. So I bought my first cap lock, my first side lock, just a traditions uh, Kentucky rifle. And for those of you familiar, terrible trigger out of the box and nothing uh, by any means high end, but I just fell in love with it. I love shooting it. I love the smell of the black powder. And it kind of escalated from from there, and you know, at this point, I've I've got more than I should share. My my wife might hear this, but just uh, <laughs> really into the flintlocks, and I guess more for me the the culture behind the accoutrements that that go with that. You know, yeah. obviously, I I do a lot of hunting and shooting pouches and flintlocks, and I've tried my hand at a few powder horns, but that's that's kind of the lane I've really fallen into, and I, I love shooting my muzzle loaders. I love getting out there and actually using these things, but um, building primarily the leather accoutrements is just something I absolutely love and spend, you know, most of my free time, if not all, doing that. So what drew you to the to the traditional leather work you said you've kind of played with and experimented with other mediums and what what made you stick with leather i i always enjoyed doing it and i had a pretty good run in the custom motorcycle world doing seats and tool bags and then kind of got into the bushcraft leather mm -hmm. if you will you know knife sheaths and little the altoid pouches and that kind oh, yeah, of thing yeah. And enjoyed it, but I just never, I don't know, it just never clicked as something I was passionate about. Um, and and I really, when I got into the more traditional firearms, the cap locks and the flint locks, I, I started, dig, you know, kind of digging into the history. And, and it just really kind of hit me, hey, I could be doing something I like with this leather work combine that with my newfound love of muzzle loading and, and kind of turn this into something. And it just really consumed me almost. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of room uh, for personality when it comes to, you know, like you say, the frontier artistry side of it, you know, I, I've played around with, you know, being outside in, in the, the modern bushcraft trend, but I think a lot of the times it's, it is what it is, you know, it, it's functional, it works, it's practical, but a lot of the times it feels like it feels the same, you know, over and over again. And, and I think yeah. you can, do you feel that way as well? You can kind of play with and, and experiment with the, the traditional, I guess, historic leather work more so than the modern stuff. Yeah, I really do. Um, you know, and, and from a standpoint of the groups who kind of, get behind and support those things. I think you make a great point, you know, in the world of the bushcraft leather side of things, you know, you can take 25 sheaths and, and put them side by side and you're not going to see a whole lot of difference. Mm -hmm. There's there's difference in levels of craftsmanship between different folks. And, you know, every once in a while you'll see some artistic expression through those and and some beautiful work make no mistake but yeah i really just you know like madison grant's book you look through that and to me i'm not one to do bench copies um but i am inspired by just a multitude of different aspects the mm -hmm. construction the shapes the the little details that you know and that's that's kind of where i like to let my mind wander and to your point i like to 
to try to put that to leather and kind of let my expressions go through that, I guess. Yeah. So if you had to assign kind of like, I guess, a time period to th to the work that you create, what what eras would you define it in? Or, or do you even think it in that way? And or is, is it is it just more flexible? No, I do. Um, I would say late 18th century to clear up to the the late 19th century, I guess, okay. is where I've kind of established as my boundaries, you know, self-imposed boundaries, if you will. Um, I just really find that, you know, there's there's a lot went on with accoutrements in that time period. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there were certainly shop made hunting pouches, for instance, uh, you start talking about some of the European, you know, game bags and so forth, much more intricate work, a lot more detail. And then, you know, down to the, uh, I guess what I would say is probably my favorite is the more what I call the homespun or backwoods look, you know, things that would have been assembled by someone out of necessity using the materials that they had, you mm -hmm. know, even, even some of those are just fascinating what they were able to come back you know come up with back then yeah there's a certain i mean I, i'm right there with you the the shop made stuff and, and the real professional examples that we have are wonderful and i think really redefine what a lot of people think about people being able to make in those time periods i think a lot of exactly. people assume that it, everything was rough and but they had it figured out you know the people at that time that were making them in the shop and producing them, you know, in, in mass, so to speak. I mean, they were trained by generations right. of experts in that. That was what they did. But mm, absolutely, the story and the that we can kind of invent in our heads about a pretty rough looking patch about or a pouch, I should say, and about the life that it lived and who carried it kind of maybe out on the fringes of, of early society here. You know, those really kind of, I think, tickle the imagination quite a bit. Yeah, they certainly do for me. And, I, you know, when you start looking at period original examples of whether it be flintlock rifles, powder horns, knives, just the materials, I think, have not lended themselves to really a lot of surviving examples of hunting pouches, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, they're made out of leather, which doesn't fare well when left to the elements or not cared for. So, I mean, there are literally so few surviving examples that I think it does kind of let your imagination, you know, and make no mistake. I don't want to rewrite history. I, I right. don't, you know, claim to be one that, you know, my opinions of what a hunting pouch was and wasn't and numbers and that sort of thing are just that their opinions, but yeah. it, it really does open up, I think a fascinating into things for me um, in just being able to kind of explore those through my work, you know? Yeah. It's, I think it's something I say a lot is that there's, there's room for, for all of it in muzzle loading, which I think is neat. You have people wanting to recreate those pristine shop made items, but then, right. you, it, but there's there's space for everybody, which is really neat. You know, if folks like us here on the East Coast or on the eastern half of the states, we're a little more interested in the earlier, you know, right up to probably 1820, 1840, it starts to fall off a little bit, at least in, right. in long rifle culture. But mm -hmm. as you get out, right. out west, that really changes a lot. And even down south, you get into the NSSA and things and it's it's kind of region focused, but it's neat because we're all united by that interest in it. It's just different eras of it. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, the main thing to me is to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something that's that's kind of shaped, I guess, my enthusiasm for the hobby. Just as you said, there there is room for all those different thoughts. And, it, you know, I, like I say, for me, it's just it's so much about just enjoying it, you, you know. And again, I, I really do enjoy getting to look at or even handle on a rare occasion, an original piece or an original accoutrement or rifle. But, you know, for for the pure enjoyment of it, I think we need to be more understanding of, of folks who have different interests across those spectrums and the different regions and everything to keep this to keep this going for generations to come, you know. For sure. So you mentioned there a little bit that you don't 
you don't like to do like a bench made or a bench copy. Could you define that maybe for some of the folks out there that uh, might not know what that term means? Sure. I guess, you know, in my mind, there's kind of three different lanes that some of the, the artists and craftsmen take on this. What I refer to as a bench copy, where you're taking a known surviving original, many times documented to some degree at least, um, and reproducing a version of that. And then you've kind of got the, the opposite side of the spectrum, which is just pure, you know, what some people call fantasy pieces. Mm. No no actual historic, you know, provenance, just just a, an idea put to life that could have possibly been around back then. And then I guess I would kind of classify myself in the middle where, you know, I like to take from a size perspective, from a shape perspective, and, and certainly some construction techniques and just the, the handmade, you know, punch the holes, sew with thread, that kind of thing. But yet in part, some of that, I, I guess we'll call it creative license for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're, you're trying to find a balance or, or would you say that you're trying to find a balance between that historic recreation and, and flexing your own creative muscles? Yeah. In, in a broad sense, yes. Um, and, and again, I like to focus on certain aspects, I guess, certain portions of originals that I've seen, the shape of a flap or, you know, the way a flap was attached or or just certain construction elements and so forth, and just kind of mix those into kind of my interpretation. I, mm. I just, you know, I again, I think aside from the shop-made bags, which there could have been dozens, could have been hundreds, there's just very little documentation to speak to any of that, but there could have been certain bags that hundreds of people had but i think for the most part once you got outside the larger cities the the more common folk as i'll as i'll call it their bags were probably very unique you know they Mm -hmm. they made them it wasn't a pattern it wasn't something that you know 25 people in the community had probably so I think that's the part that's fascinating for me. And that's kind of what I try to do, make every bag unique and in its own. And, uh, you know, my wife will tell you I'm crazy. I kind of develop a backstory in my head as I build every bag. Who would have carried this? When would that have happened? You know, what what area of the country would they have been uh-huh. from and, and so forth? And I, I don't know. I just, like I say, I kind of get consumed by it. And that's part of what I love about it. Yeah. And I don't think that's crazy at all. I th- I think that's a layer of of all of this that, you know, I think we all feel a little bit crazy, but I think we all do it or a lot of us in the community do do it. You know, I think Mm -hmm. in a sense, there's still that little kid in us that's out in the woods with a stick. That's their rifle, you know, and they're running, you know, (laughs) but you know, as adults and, and as we age, we find other ways to, to flex and scratch our, that itch a little bit, I guess I would say, you know, so no, I think that's right. What, uh, it's a little bit off topic here, but what references, if any, are you using, you know, uh, is it just your life experience and, and books and, and things that you've read or watched that you're using to inform that, you know, these stories that you're developing, or is it, is it just, you know, kind of loose and flowing as you're, as you're going through the process? I guess truth be told, it's probably a combination of all of that, okay. it, you know, like I said, I, I like to look at some of the the sketchbooks of the time, you know, and and so forth. And certainly Madison Grant's, you know, the Kentucky Rifle mm-hmm. Hunting Pouch and that kind of thing is is certainly inspiration. Um, but then I, you know, I'll sit around for days, sometimes a couple of weeks, with a thought in my head. You know, how about a guy that would have lived in you know Southern Tennessee, in the mountains in the late 1700s, what, what kind of pouch would he have carried? What materials would that have been made of? And, and just kind of build from there, I guess. Yeah. I've, I've been doing that a little bit on my own, you know, just with, in my sketchbook, you know, I I can't go out and shoot all the time. So it's nice to kind of escape into that every now and then and, and read about people from the time and, and think about that. I just, I don't know. I think that's just, uh, I love doing that. <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe the listeners too. out there are thinking I'm, uh, you know, that we're a couple of crazy kooks over here. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I I really do. I think that's uh, 
that's kind of when you tip into the being passionate about it part of it. Mm. it you know, I mean, let's be honest. It's it's not hard these days to find a nice flintlock rifle and then, you, you know, make no mistake, there are dozens of guys building hunting and shooting pouches and accoutrements and powder horns and whatnot out there. But I think when you're able to, to let your mind kind of go and, and start to wander like that, I really do think that's when you, you've kind of crossed the line into being passionate about this this whole community and hobby and everything surrounding it. Mm-hmm. I think on the on the exterior, you know, if you're not interested in, in muzzleloading or, or the culture that, you know, all revolves around it, really, it's it's easy to to come up in your mind i think commonly you know just thinking about it as as a firearms culture or a gun culture um, right but i th- i think that there the things like that the, those really personal touches in the already the the community's dominated i would say by handmade items because there's so many wonderful craftspeople making things to yeah. support us that want to to get involved and want to carry something unique but i think that's really what sets it apart from even just other hobby communities out there because it's there's some aspects of it that have been mechanized and and you know i guess the consumerism of it you know you have mass produced items and things but sure there's still i can pick up one of your bags and and know that you made it with your hands and you have this story behind it and then if i take it out into the woods i'm contributing to that story and then maybe some someday down the road, my grandkids will will carry that Jeff Luke bag, you know, and that's what gets exactly. gets me going on all this. It's just it's so neat, and uh, you know, I think crafts people like you are are really a, a really important part of that. You know, connecting us through the items that you're making to the past and and to the future. So I I really appreciate you, and and everybody no, out there a, like you. That's a great point. I mean, I I think that. It is important to understand. And, you know, again, you don't necessarily have to spend countless hours doing the research to be involved in these things and, and whatnot. But um, it really does kind of give you an appreciation. And you, you touched on it earlier, just what they are capable of back then mm-hmm. with, you know, think about it. They didn't have the climate controlled warmth or cool of their house and a in a well-lit shop perhaps and and some of those things and when you look at the level of craftsmanship and just start to kind of soak that in and let that let that really kind of sink in your mind it, it truly is inspiring yeah yeah it makes you at least it makes me think that you know i can i can do it i can do things right i mean exactly. our, our forefathers went through a lot so that we could be here and uh, it's fun to continue that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you and I have talked. I think one of the things that's important for all of us is to try to get younger people involved. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've jokingly, well, I think I've told you, you, you know, all of us 50, 60 something gray haired, pot bellied guys are going to be gone someday. <laughs> the important thing is who carries it on after that, you know? Mm hmm. And that's that's something I've really been thinking about a lot lately, you know, how to get more younger people involved and and kind of at least show it to them. And it may not be something they gravitate toward right away, but just plant those seeds, you know. Yeah. And I think having a, a cool bag, you know, not <laughs> I'm not <laughs> I'm not, you know, pimping Jeff out here in his work, but, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> no, going out and being able to get I mean, I'm not, I, I, I have modern firearms and I enjoy shooting them, but at the end of the day, a lot of, a lot of that stuff is the same compared to everybody else at the range. But right. I know that even if I put together a kit, a kit muzzleloader, it's going to be a little bit different than the guy next to me at the range. Mm-hmm. And that's right. it's neat to, to be able to pick out a bunch of items and things and really kit yourself out with stuff that you really personally like. And then you can go to an event and and see what other people personally like and get ideas. And I mean, I don't know how much time I spend on on the forums and Facebook groups just seeing how other people are doing it and thinking, agree, yeah. What if you did this or that? You know, kind of borrowing that idea a little bit. And like, uh, I've seen a lot of people getting into uh, like 18th century fishing kits. You know, to have right. in their have mm-hmm. in their bags and things. And I'm just like, 
man, I never thought about that. You know, why wouldn't yeah. you have an ability to go, you know, the tools to go fishing? I love to go fishing. Of course, you know, right. the version of me in the 1800s would have liked to go fishing too. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating about it for me is just the possibilities of what those things could have looked like, what they could Mm -hmm. have been made of, what they could have consisted of, you know. Do you ever get drained? Like, do you ever feel like you've made, you know, all the bags you think you can make or or do you just keep making them? Uh, You know what? I haven't. And I jokingly say if that day comes, it, it may be time to to think about backing away from it, but I'm not there yet. I, mm. I don't know. I wake up every morning and get those first couple cups of coffee in me and I'm in the shop before I go to my real job. And I still love everything about it. And it, it keeps me going, I guess, more so than anything. But I, I guess I kind of look at it as my therapy, you know, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> from the, from the modern world and the <laughs> chaos and everything else. Yeah. It's good to step back in time. I think. Yeah, I enjoy it. I I truly do. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full-bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. So you you mentioned there that you know you're not doing this full time. I don't I don't know that any of us are really. <laughs> right. Um, what does a what does a typical day or week look like for you? I mean, you don't have to go into your your total schedule, but how do sure. you how do you go through working and then making the bags that you're making or the or the items that you're making too? It is it is truly something I spend most of my free time with. Um, you know, in the mornings I'm, I'm in the shop and sometimes it's to sit here and think about that backstory for the next bag, like I mentioned, or sometimes it's just cutting out a couple of bags to, to be put together to date, to be determined later. And then I'm fortunate, uh, you know, that I do go on a kind of a weird schedule. I'm up every morning by 3 a.m. And I get more done. I joke with people. I get more done before seven, eight o'clock in the morning than than most people do, I think, you, you know, <laughs> halfway through the day yeah. in conventional terms, noon or whatever. Um, but I just, I, like I say, I love doing it. And and the weekends, I do the same thing. You know, I, I spend usually a solid four, five, six hours, Saturdays and Sundays in the shop. And uh, that's just, that's my time. You mm-hmm. know, I just kind of meld into the shop here. And some days that's, you know, full tilt, full steam ahead. And other times it's just sitting here reflecting on projects for the future and whatnot. So are you, are you starting with, you know, like a sketchbook with some items drawn out or or notes on things? Or are you storing it, you know, all in your noggin and then taking it straight to leather? You know, I, I have recently started sketching some of these things out when they pop into my head, but oh. unfortunately a lot of them are are in the noggin alone and some of those get lost because Mm -hmm. when you get to be my age you start to uh you know forget what you had for dinner the night before much less an idea that popped in your head two weeks ago so i started (laughs) to kind of just crudely jot down some of those things or or even if it's just a couple lines about you know a construction method i want to try or something like that so i'm trying to be better about that but truth be told most of it's just up in my head yeah i think if it's at least in my experience, it's a little more natural, you know, at times, like sometimes there's just an idea that is there and it do- it doesn't let go of you. And it's, right. sometimes it's just easier to just get to it, get to the materials and make something and let it flow. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's one thing I always encourage people that, that want to get started in this. Just buy that first piece of leather. You know, it, it doesn't have to be you know, 
prime bark tan or brain tan or even vegetable tan cowhide for that matter just just get a piece of leather and you know that's that's one of the things that i'm i guess obsessive if you ask my wife maybe i i literally have probably three dozen hides on hand at any time so i i do a lot of times if i've got something pop into my head i i just go cut it out you know it may Mm -hmm. sit there for four months it may get done the next day but I, I try to at least get the shape and the, the general thought. And then, you know, if for no other reason, if it is four months before I come back to it, it's cut out. It, it kind of brings it back to me pretty quick when I look at that piece or the pieces that I've cut out to assemble one. For anybody out there that's kind of listening and, and interested in, in getting started in this, where, uh, you know, could you recommend some sources for for leather and and the and what kind of equipment would you recommend somebody needs to to get started making some bags or accoutrements like this yeah i still function with uh, i would say very limited and and reasonably priced tools i think that's something that intimidates a lot of people they think they're going to have to have hundreds and hundreds of dollars of you know either antique original leather working tools or you know more modern day top of the line I would say 95% of my work is done with a a typical utility knife, you know, Stanley knife, if you Mm -hmm. will. Um, I've got several different punches and awls, um, harness needles and some linen thread, and then obviously your leather. Um, You know, I'll be completely honest. Tandy leather kind of takes a bad rap. They're the the, the Walmart of the leather world, if you will. But at a fairly reasonable price, anyone can go in and get the basic tools, kind of as I just described, and be doing leather work, you mm-hmm. know, without sinking a lot of money into it. And you don't feel like then you're committed and and have to do something with it. I still use the original mallet and, and a couple of the awls that I had 15 years ago. You know, they, they're something that will last like most tools, I guess, decent tools anyway, um, the last. So, you know, you don't necessarily need to have the best and, you know, you can, you can produce some pretty nice work with very basic leather tools. And and what kind of, of dye are you using? Um, you know, you don't have to go into trade secrets, but to, to get the color on things, I, I, I get a lot of, a lot of questions about, you know, coloring and, and aging leather a little bit so that it looks a little bit more natural rather than, you know, just the the tan finish on it. Yeah, I do use a lot of Feeblings um, mm-hmm. leather dye. They're, okay. they're one of the larger producers of commercial leather dye. I Where I like to think you can really kind of express your creativity to some degree, but then also produce a more realistic bag is in what you do with that. Um, You know, I've mentioned in a couple of my classes, I very rarely use leather dye straight out of the bottle. I typically mix colors. Um, I I generally stick with about three or four of their colors. Um, And you can do a lot of different things as far as the actual coloration, the the density and so forth just by mixing those colors and then also thinning that with um, isopropyl alcohol, you know, just regular rubbing alcohol like you get at the drugstore. Um, you can really, with some practice, you can really produce some amazing results with that. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know there's a lot of folks out there wanting to get started and, and building kits and, and wanting to make their own accoutrements. So I'm hoping that helps them out there. No, absolutely. And and there's a lot of other, you know, obviously more natural, more mm-hmm. period correct um, dyes that you can do. You know, everybody talks about the walnut hull dye. I make a batch or two of that every year and do some bags with that and some accoutrements and so forth. So there's there's a number of things you can do as far as trying to reproduce a more period correct or historically correct approach to the dye work on it. But, um, you know, I, I like to tell people it's to me, like I say, it's about having fun. And a lot of people don't want to go to the trouble of collecting walnut holes and, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing and, and making a batch of that. And so to get started, you know, I absolutely just recommend picking up a couple different shades of brown and some rubbing alcohol and kind of playing around with it. And, you know, I always tell people that first bag 
you do probably won't look like a Ken Scott bag. I know mine certainly didn't, um, and and I would argue they probably still don't. But <laughs> you know, you you can do a lot in just jumping in and getting your feet wet, getting started. And and for some people, that first bag will be the last. They don't really you know find an enjoyment which is great but you'll have something you made with your own hands and you can always be proud of that i think it's it's important to make stuff with your hands and i think as people that's something that we need it's great to see people doing it yeah it really is especially you know in our modern society when everything's built to be thrown away and replaced in a relatively short time it it definitely, for me, certainly brings a, a sense of personal gratification when you know that that bag that you've carried for the last, whatever, seven seasons is something you made. You know, mm-hmm. that uh, it's hard to, hard to beat that feeling. Yeah. And, and maybe it's a little esoteric, I guess, but, you know, kind of talking about the, the lack of originals in comparison to like the number of people over the years. It, it's neat I think because they're all natural materials, you know, it's not like we're driving down the road, seeing a bunch of hunting pouches along the road. You know, if that gets to that point, it's just going to go back into the earth. It's not, it's Mm -hmm. not really waste. It just gets reused, you know, down the road. I think it's something really wonderful about it. I agree. Are there any go-to books that you'd recommend or other resources for people to check out? Yeah, I mentioned the the Madison Grant, you know, the Kentucky Rifle Hunting Pouch. I think from a historical and just being able to see a large number of original bags, you know, in photos, Mm -hmm. um, great reference. I I still pick mine up every couple weeks and just kind of peruse through it and something will strike me that you know i hadn't noticed or whatever um the other one i really think is a great resource for someone new to to building particularly hunting pouches uh tc albert who has been doing this stuff for years has a book that he titled recreating the 18th century hunting pouch Mm -hmm. um that one goes into a lot more detail about actually building one of these bags and he includes several patterns in the back of the book that you can use so yeah i definitely recommend that for someone who is kind of brand new to this and and wants to try their hand at building them another great resource that's great thank you very much you know as we kind of wrap up here if if people have heard never heard of you before and and maybe they've heard about you now where can they find your work and and where can they see it and and maybe reach out to talk to you about a bag most of my exposure is through facebook i run a business page po'boy leather um and that's on facebook like i say i share most of my work on instagram as well um under at hide stitcher um, I don't have a website or anything, and to be, you know, completely honest and not to discourage people from contacting me, I just don't do custom orders anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I have kind of found the most enjoyment out of just kind of building what pops into my head and, and then, you know, list those for sale in those avenues. But um, that's where they can find me, and, um, you know, I always enjoy talking to people, Um I've got several people that I recommend if they are adamant about a certain bag that they would like reproduced or whatever. Some of my fellow craftsmen and and to be glad to share that information with them as if that's something they're interested in as well. I'm I'm keenly aware I'm not the only guy in town doing this, so I like to support <laughs> other craftsmen as well and yeah. and you know push work their way as well. Mm-hmm. Do you do any events or shows? Um, right now it's kind of limited mm-hmm. this year. I'm, I'm hoping to kind of make plans for a 2023 that involves quite a few more shows, but the CLA show, um, I've done for the past several years. Um, Mel Hankla and, uh, Frank house have, have done for the past couple of years. Now this fall frolic, which is another great show. Uh, I was in Lawrenceburg, this past year um and then actually right up the road from me here in cincinnati the previous year but i believe they're they're trying to get lawrenceburg lined up again for this year so those mm-hmm. are my two big shows but i'd like to to broaden that quite a bit next year well, that's cool i think uh 
I'm definitely going to be seeking you out here at a few events and, and coming to bug you a little bit. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Never a bother. I'll, uh, we'll have links uh, to everything that Jeff's talked about, the the resources, as well as his uh, social media profiles in the in the show notes. And also have uh, a selection of, I think, probably my favorite bags that Jeff has put together in the blog post that goes with the episode. So you, if you've not seen Jeff's work before, there's a few places that you can check it out. And, and I hope that you do. If nothing else, when it comes to Jeff's work... It, if he's not making something that you like one week, there's going to be a couple more pretty soon that you're going <laughs> that you're going to be liking. So yeah, I try to be productive. <laughs> yeah, and you certainly are. I uh, boy, I, I would think that you'd be investing in a coffee companies by now, but <laughs> well, I guess depending on who you talk to, I probably do. <laughs> Well, is there, is there anything else, Jeff, I guess, as far as the formal episode goes? I know we're getting a little close to time here. I don't want to keep you too long, but... I would just encourage people to, to try their hand at it. You know, if, mm-hmm. if, like I say, if it's something you fall in love with and, and you want to produce 50, 60 bags a year, that's fantastic. But if you're able to do it and can make something by your own two hands that can be passed along to your children, your grandchildren, you know, just give it a try. I mean, again, you can, you can do it for a a relatively minimal cost and, you know, anybody that has questions about more details as far as specifics on, on some of those things we talked about as far as materials and tools, by all means, they can reach out to me through the the links that you're going to share there. Um, I I really do enjoy seeing people do it. And and that would be my guidance to them. Just, just try it. You know, like I say, that first one's not going to be a work of art probably, but with a little care and and patience, it can be something that will last you a lifetime. I'd like to thank Jeff again for taking time out of his day to, to talk with me and, and, and talk with all of you really about his work and, and what inspires it and, and how he goes about it. I hope that you have maybe learned a little bit something uh, from Jeff here. I know I have learned a lot from Jeff over the years. And, um, you know, before I met Jeff, I, I had played with making a few bags of my own in, in the 4-H shooting sports program. I, I had made my first shooting pouch. And after being able to observe a few of Jeff's classes and and watch his work and his willingness to share what he knows online, just openly and, and for anybody, you know, it, I would be, uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say it was an inspiration in, in many aspects for, for what we're doing here with, I love muzzleloading and a way to, uh, to share things and, and promote it openly and freely. Um, I think Jeff does a lot Something that we didn't talk about was the traditional American craftsman Facebook group. Jeff and a friend, I believe I I could be, I could be misquoting this, but Jeff and a friend started this a few years ago and and the group has grown, I think over the past year, uh, it it just reached 10,000 members of, of enthusiasts and people interested in replicating traditional American crafts from the 18th and 19th centuries. So if you want to learn more from Jeff and hear a little bit about his process as he's going through some of the bags that he makes, I encourage you to check out that group and um, and see some of his posts and his post history there. He's described and and gone through a lot of, of what he does and how he thinks to to help further educate people on on one way to do things. You know, Jeff's a, a really kind and an honest guy about that. You know, he's he's not telling you the only way to do it. And uh, he's just telling you the way he does it. And and you can take it from there, you know, and, and involve your own style and, and combine it with other things that you've learned. And uh, it's really nice to see that in this community. I think we, we talked to Frank House last year about that, that uh, there's a sense in the community and the, the, the winds have really shifted and, and people are really uh, willing to share what they know and, and, and pass it on. And, and Jeff is continuing that great tradition, I think. Um, so I, I really can't thank him enough and, uh, you know, check out his work and, uh, and I think you'll learn something and, and if nothing else, you'll be inspired. That's for sure. Like I said, we'll have links to everything that we talked about in this episode in the show notes for the episode in the description. We'll also have uh, a lot of photos and things of Jeff's work at ilovemuzzleloading.com. You can check out the podcast section of the website and see all of our other interviews and the blog posts and the images that go along with them. 
as spring is coming here to the Midwest, we're getting out and, and doing a lot more activities. I'm kind of planning my spring and summer travel schedule now. If you're listening to this uh, before March 19th, uh, you'll know that you can catch me there at the Kalamazoo Living History Show in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'll be uh, helping out with the show quite a bit as, as one of the volunteer staff members, but I'll also have a table there with my father. So if you see me at that show or any show this year uh, that you're listening to this, you know, depending on when you're listening to this, uh, you know, feel free to stop me and say hi, you know, tell me about how you got into muzzling. I love to hear how we all come together into this great community and, and, and hear from all the people that make it up. I mean, without all of you out there, this community couldn't exist. And I think it's, it's wonderful, uh, to go from kind of the stuck inside through the winter, you know, kind of working our own stuff to be able to meet up and catch up at events. So, uh, I look forward to seeing you as we, uh, as we head out to events this year. And, uh, if you're looking for events to travel to, you can check out the website as well. We have a, an entire events page there with events from around the country with their flyers and details and things. So, even if you're not in the Midwest where I'm at, I try to post uh, flyers from all over the country uh, to help you find a place to go meet enthusiasts in your area. As always, I'd like to thank you so much for listening. Um, it's been a wild ride this past year as we approach the first full year here of I Love Muzzleloading, uh, and it's been a wonderful one. And uh, I can't thank you all enough for your support. I can't thank my wife, Paisley Yazel, enough uh, for her support as well. If you see her at a show with me, you know, please thank her for, for her patience and her own dedication to the community. Although you don't see her uh, on camera or anything, she is a, a strong advocate for I Love Muzzleloading and for the community as a whole. Um, she's very supportive of muzzleloading and muzzleloading enthusiasts. So, um, you know, I can't thank her enough for uh <laughs> for putting up with me i guess <laughs> uh once again i'm ethan i love muzzleloading thank you so much for listening we'll catch you next time